CCFR versus Canada, as you're probably all aware, uh, Justice Kane of the Federal Court of Canada ruled against the CCFR and everyone else that was uh, part of that case on every single grounds. And basically, it was a pretty scant decision um, when you read it and just basically says, yeah, I agree with the government. You said this, the government said that, and I agree with the government on every single, on every single point. Rod and Tracy from the CCFR expressed their frustrations after Justice Kane's ruling. Are they right to question Justice Kane? Or perhaps their arguments just weren't all that strong to begin with. Let's have a look. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be continuing our CCFR versus Canada series. In our previous video in the series, we did an overview of the entire case and broadly discussed the various issues which were raised by the applicants as well as what the judge, Justice Kane, ruled in regards to each of them. Now from here on out in the series, we'll be discussing things a lot more specifically. As I mentioned in the previous video, some of the arguments brought forth by the applicants were <laughs> honestly not all that strong in my opinion, and the judge was certainly not wrong to dismiss them. However, there was also no shortage of pretty substantial and solid arguments being made by the applicants, which I felt the Attorney General of Canada really responded to with minimal evidence and shaky reasoning. Even in instances like these, Justice Kane still opted to decide with the government anyway. Which was kind of odd. In judicial review, the courts are required to give the government deference for their actions, and it is well established in Canada that the courts are not there to babysit the government or to unnecessarily curtail their powers and rule in their stead. As a result, the court generally doesn't want to interfere any more than it absolutely has to, but that doesn't mean that the deference given should be limitless. Or, at least it's not supposed to be. For instance, in determining whether or not the use of the OIC powers was lawful under section 117.15 subsection 2 of the Criminal Code, the judge determined that the statute should be interpreted broadly. Which could actually seem reasonable based on what she said. However, even with a broad interpretation, that alone couldn't have been enough to save the government's interpretation of their powers in this section. So Justice Kane instead interpreted the regulation so broadly as to effectively render the statute meaningless. And this was necessary in order to justify the government's actions. Now, I'll explain the specifics of that argument in part 5 of this series when we get there, but that is clearly not a reasonable interpretation of the statute since it essentially says that the statute doesn't really do anything at all. But that interpretation was the only interpretation which could have justified the government's actions, and therefore, that's what she ruled. And while correctness is not the aim of this particular part of the judicial review, the government, as well as the courts, can only use a range of reasonable interpretations. Unreasonable interpretations for the governing statutes are not available to them as justifications for their actions. If you watched my previous video where I did an overview of this ruling, you'll know that decisions and interpretations like that one were hardly a one-off occasion either. Now, individually, any one of these peculiarities could certainly be questionable on its own, but that alone would not be evidence enough to prove any sort of claim regarding to prejudice or bias, at least not in my opinion. However, if you stack enough of these oddities up against each other, you'll very clearly begin to see a rather disturbing trend emerge throughout Justice Kane's ruling. I'm also putting this video fairly early on in the series so that people can have this information in mind as they watch the rest of the series, but there will be a great many times throughout this process where I will show you that Justice Kane ruled something a little weird or, you know, contradictory, or perhaps not entirely rationally or reasonably. So by putting this video near the start of the series, you may be able to more clearly see that these are not exactly isolated incidents, but rather a repetitive pattern of kind of unusual behavior. Or maybe you won't. I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'm just here to let you know what the court ruled, and how I interpreted it, and what I think about it. You can and should make up your own mind if any of it raises to the level of prejudice or bias, as I think it does. That's worth mentioning again, but I'm certainly no lawyer. It may well be that some of her decisions are entirely correct, and my interpretation of any perceived bias on her part may simply be my own ignorance of the law or jurisprudence or whatever else. It's also important to mention that there are many frustrations regarding this ruling which we may believe or perceive to be wrong as a matter of, you know, fairness or morality or whatever, but that does not necessarily mean that Justice Kane is wrong or that she made a mistake or that she is displaying any kind of bias or prejudice. There are lots of laws in Canada, even constitutional laws, which are overtly unfair to citizens in favor of government power. So I do want to be clear that when I use these terms, you know, bias or prejudice, I don't use them lightly, and I don't mean that she ruled in a way that I simply don't like or that is somehow detriment to me personally, or to our culture, or our community, or anything like that. 
Now, I also don't mean that she was colluding with the government or that she was acting in some corrupt manner. What I actually mean is that she ruled in a way inconsistent with the law, inconsistent with established precedents such as Vavilov, or, in several instances, even things which were internally inconsistent with herself at various other points in her own case. But that doesn't mean that every negative thing she ruled was necessarily somehow the result of bias or prejudice. For example, for those who are familiar with the case, you probably already know this, but for those who are not, the government actually refused to disclose the information upon which they justified the enactment of the OIC in the first place. And they didn't just refuse to disclose it, they actually made it confidential under Section 39 of the Canadian Evidence Act. Which isn't necessarily all that unusual. Like, the government makes all sorts of communications and documents restricted from public view for all sorts of reasons. However, Justice Kane ruled that this wasn't at all suspicious, and that there was no adverse inference to be drawn from this action by the government. Now this is weird because when conducting a reasonableness review under the current framework in Canada, Vavilov considers what it calls the hallmarks of reasonableness, namely justification, intelligibility, and transparency. Confidentiality is literally the direct opposite of transparency, and this is even specifically addressed in Vavilov. Quote, Judicial review is concerned with both the outcome of the decision and the reasoning process that led to that outcome. And reasoning is further defined in paragraph 79 of Babylon, where they go on to say, quote, Reasons explain how and why a decision was made. They help to show affected parties that their arguments have been considered and demonstrate that the decision was made in a fair and lawful manner. Reasons shield against arbitrariness, as well as the perception of arbitrariness, in the exercise of public power. So according to Babylon, reasons require both a how and a why. Now the reus laid out in the OIC is clearly the why, but they never actually disclose the how. While this on its own may not be enough to compel the government to waive its cabinet confidence, it absolutely should have been enough to be treated as suspicious. And on top of that, there is other precedent, and even Supreme Court precedent, which says that adverse inferences are entirely possible in instances such as these, and the applicants even brought it up specifically. Now even beyond the legality of it aside, the applicants also mentioned that if cabinet actually had a sound basis for the justification of OIC in the first place, it wouldn't be rational to hide it behind cabinet confidence. After all, it could only serve to strengthen the government's case if any such information actually existed at all, and if it was relied upon. Additionally, the applicant said it could indicate that the government actually had information which would have invalidated the government's opinion in the first place as to why these firearms needed to be banned, and that's why the information was made confidential. And all of these are completely valid concerns. And the AGC responded by saying it wasn't really all that relevant and that such information just isn't even a factor in judicial review. Which, I mean, that's not really much of an answer, and honestly, that was about the entirety of their response. Justice Kane then went on a pretty long spiel doing the Attorney General's homework for them, and then explaining why maybe it's fine that they're actually not disclosing information. She then concluded that this isn't suspicious, and that no adverse inference should be drawn from the government for making this information confidential. She said that there was no reason to believe that they didn't have the information just because they didn't want to disclose it, and that the information in the Rias would be sufficient to justify their reasoning. But like I said, the Rias only explains the why the OIC does what it does, not the how the government and council form the opinion in the first place. The difference is, it's a little subtle, but they're not the same thing. Justice Kane then also later explained, in the same ruling, that she knows that she doesn't have enough information to rule against the government. In the section regarding whether the OIC was ultra vires, in paragraph 304, she had this to say, quote, The court cannot find any fatal flaw in the decision or in the process to reach the decision, to the extent that the process can be gleaned from the order and counsel, the summary provided to justify their reliance on section 39 of the Canadian Evidence Act, and the considerations noted in the Rias, which the court assumes were among the considerations of the governor and counsel." End quote. So she says it's not an issue, and that it's not suspicious, and that no adverse inference is to be drawn, but then she also says that she can't find any fatal flaw, and that she has to glean information, and that she has to make assumptions about how the governor and council formed the opinion that these firearms were not reasonable for use in hunting or sport. So yeah, it's all, it's all very strange. But stuff like that doesn't quite rise to the level of bias in and of itself, in my opinion. Just because I think it's highly bizarre and counterintuitive and nonsensical, that doesn't necessarily mean she was wrong to do it. Sometimes that's just the way the law is, and I don't know enough about confidentiality or precedents regarding Section 39 of the Canadian Evidence Act to really call her out on it. There are also other instances in this case regarding things like procedural fairness or question of constitutionality, where Justice Kane appears to simply duck the questions 
saying that these issues can be just later addressed once someone has been charged with a crime and once their freedom is on the line. Then they can spend, you know, the countless thousands of dollars and months or even years of their lives defending themselves in court rather than just having her answer the questions, you know, now? <laughs> Before all that happens? Now again, this seems weird, especially since these concerns were completely on topic and very clearly going to be scenarios which will definitely happen as a result of the OIC. And it feels like she avoids addressing these concerns intentionally because of the unfavorable answers they would have generated, but that may not be the case. It may well be that these things are truly just not in the scope of her job regarding the judicial review process, and that she is actually supposed to let other courts decide these things as a result of criminal proceedings. Now, <laughs> I think that's some pretty severe BS, but if that is actually how the system works, then that's a problem with the system itself. That's not necessarily Justice Kane being biased or prejudiced against us gun owners. However, there are other areas where the jurisprudence is rather clear, and she still opts to avoid the issue. In her ruling, Justice Kane makes no attempt to scrutinize the Attorney General's position. She makes no attempts to question their assertions. She makes no obvious attempts to actually get the Attorney General to rigorously define any of their invented terms, nor does she attempt to explain those definitions for herself out of inference. She took nearly everything that the Attorney General said at face value. Now, all of this wouldn't necessarily be that damning if these questions weren't being asked by the applicants themselves. After all, in judicial review, the government is owed deference and the judge isn't there to do the work of the applicants for them. But these questions were asked. Frequently. Not only that, but these assertions and newly invented terms were entirely the justification for the enactment of the OIC in the first place, and therefore were fundamentally the focal point of this case. The judge should have every interest in trying to discern very specifically what these terms mean in order to determine if there is any rational connection between their actual meaning and the objectives set out in the RIAS. This is what she is supposed to be doing during a judicial review. Gray areas and uncertainties can show up in even the most well-intentioned and carefully drafted laws and regulations. It is entirely the job of the judge to alleviate and rectify these misunderstandings in a case like this. That's why she's here. That's the, that's the whole point of this. And yet, she failed to do it. But failed isn't even really the right word. It's more like she showed a direct lack of interest in doing it at all. Let me explain here. In every court case and ruling, judges set definitions for what they're discussing. Without fail. It's always done. And this is because the law hinges on definitions. Even for simple words, or words that we use every day in our lives, they don't always have the same meaning when used in court, so judges always make a point of explaining exactly what it is that they're talking about, so that anyone looking at the ruling has no doubt in their mind what it is that they're actually ruling on. For example, even a simple word like hatred isn't a simple word in the law. It's a word that we all use or hear regularly in our lives, but in the case of the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission versus Whatcott in 2013, they actually had to define it. And this was a case discussing hate speech and is actually slated to become the official national benchmark of what hate speech is if Bill C-63 ever passes and is signed into law. So even for a word as normal as hatred, the Supreme Court took 26 paragraphs to define it. They went over all, you know, the ins and outs of how we use it, what the legislature intended, previous precedent where it was used, what the threshold for the word should be, and so on. Now you contrast that with this case, where no one actually seems willing to define what an assault-style rifle actually is. Justice Kane does usually refer to this definition in the RIAS, but she also allows the information within this definition to go undefined. Like, what is modern? What is tactical? What is rapid fire? What is sustained fire? What do these things mean? Nobody knows! But whatever they are, Justice Kane refers to it as apparent. Whatever an assault-style rifle actually is, it is apparent that it is one. And this was even pointed out by the other applicants. The applicant said that it's a general term and that the RIAS is inaccurate. That the firearms on this list don't actually comply with the definition laid out in the RIAS. But when pressed on this, Justice Kane ruled that it's a non-issue because these terms don't actually show up in the regulations. And, okay, fair enough, they don't actually show up in the regulations. But how can we be sure that the firearms on this list actually comply with this definition? How can we know for sure that the government is actually banning assault-style rifles as the RIAS claims they are, if we don't even know what they are? How can we be sure that there are no firearms on this list which are not actually assault-style firearms? These are fair questions, and Justice Kane avoids tackling the issue simply by saying that the definition isn't important, since it's never actually used in the regulations itself. 
But without a definition, how can we know whether or not banning these firearms was reasonable? And that's the very thing we're supposed to be trying to investigate in this judicial review. Now, spoiler alert, it's not, but I'll explain why in more detail in part four. Another of these terms is the word variant. Now, the word variant does actually show up in the regulations, but Justice Kane still allowed even that word to go undefined. Not only that, but the use of the word variant meant that there would be unnamed models of firearms which would be prohibited by the OAC at a later date without notification to the public and without it being written down into law, thereby creating an issue of vagueness. Now, this is a pretty severe problem. Most people already know that ignorance of the law is not innocence of the law, but it becomes an issue of vagueness if it's not possible to actually know what the law is. And this is an issue of constitutionality. But, not to worry, government expert Mr. Maury Smith says it's obvious what a variant is. In fact, he says it's so obvious that it's easy for firearm owners at home to determine this on their own. Its obviousness is what makes it obvious. It's just so obvious, obviously. In fact, it's so obvious that he can't even tell us what it is. Us firearm owners should just know what it is, obviously. But he said that even among experts, there can be dispute about what a variant is or isn't. Something which he was then called out on by the CCFR and the Doherty applicants, and he was unable to state exactly what these totally obvious features were that were so obvious. All of this was put before Justice Kane, and the experts from both the applicants and the respondent agree that there is no hard and fast definition about what a variant is. However, the applicants did propose an actual concrete definition which was easy to understand. And their definition was that any firearm which has the unmodified frame or receiver of another firearm was a variant. However, and this was rightly pointed out, that if that definition was used, it would result in having to remove a lot of firearms from the list. Most of the firearms from the list. And Justice Kane saw this issue, and rather than questioning if maybe there's something wrong with the list, which of course there is, she instead decided to just refrain from defining it. And the government's idea of what a variant is constitutes an idea that is so broad that according to government expert Mr. Maury Smith, Something can be a variant simply as a result of marketing, which means it has nothing to do intrinsically with its design or features or capabilities. Now, unless, of course, it's marketed as a sporting rifle, as most of these firearms are, in which case we would disregard that marketing in favor of its other features. Now, for any impartial judge, that should have been a glaring double standard to be rectified, but for Justice Kane, wasn't an issue, not a big deal. <laughs> However, even Mr. Smith couldn't explain why some firearms were on the list even with his infinitely flexible and constantly evolving interpretation of what a variant actually is. Which is interesting, considering how obvious he said this was supposed to be, even for someone who isn't an expert. At the end of dozens and dozens of paragraphs of this nonsense, Justice Kane finally ruled this. In paragraph 547, she said that the named variants set out in the regulations do not raise vagueness concerns. The criminal code and regulations are accessible and clear. The regulations were communicated directly to the registered firearm owners and more broadly, and firearm owners and businesses are expected to know the law. So in 547, she says that firearm owners and businesses are responsible to know the law, which is entirely true. However, she then says in the very next paragraph, 548, that these hidden unnamed variants are okay because absolute certainty of the law is not required. Meaning I have to know what the law is, but the law itself doesn't have to know what the law is meaning there's no actual way for me to know what the law is in order to abide by it, which will expose me to extreme criminal liability, even if I try my best to follow the law. And according to Kane, that's perfectly fine, <laughs> I guess. She says it's because the public should just look up the firearms reference table. Well, I did look up the firearms reference table. And you know what the RCMP has to say about it? The firearms reference table is not a legal instrument. The aforementioned act and regulations are the prevailing legal authority with respect to firearms classification. So the RCMP itself says that the firearms reference table isn't a legally binding document. It's not statute. It's not law. It's their recommendation that if you want to know what the law actually is, look at the statutes. Look, you know, look at the actual law. That's what the RCMP says. So whatever the law says supersedes whatever the firearms reference table says according to the RCMP. Yet Justice Kane says that if you want to know what the law is, you can't look at only the statutes, you need more information that is on the FRT. And this is hardly the only time her rulings are based on contradictions in this review. And even from within Justice Kane's ruling itself, government expert Mr. Smith had this to say about the firearms reference table. He said the FRT is a non-binding administrative tool. 
Other government users could reach a different opinion on the classification of a firearm, as could firearm businesses and individual firearms owners. And what this all means is that even if you go above and beyond any reasonable due diligence and check the FRT every single day to find out if you've become a criminal today as the result of a stroke of a bureaucratic pen, the FRT doesn't actually even have the final say. A police officer or even the courts could still declare something to be a variant after the fact, even if the FRT doesn't deem it to be in the first place. This means you could still go to prison as a result. And this is exactly the situation that vagueness tries to avoid. And according to Chartopedia, the doctrine of vagueness is directed into ensuring fair notice to citizens and limiting enforcement discretion of officials. It is a principle of fundamental justice that the penalty imposed on an accused requires proof of fault reflecting the offense and punishment. Where an offense carries the potential for imprisonment, negligence is required as the minimum level of mens rea, in that at least a defense of due diligence must be open to an accused for an offense to accord with the principles of fundamental justice. Vagueness can lead to other problems such as absolute liability offenses, which are also unconstitutional in Canada for the same reason. And I'm actually kind of surprised this doesn't appear to have been mentioned by the applicants in this case. An absolute liability offense is where you are automatically guilty simply for committing the offense. There is no requirement for the mens rea and therefore no possibility for the defense of a mens rea. Any absolute liability offense backed up by prison time is unconstitutional. The example given by the ruling over the BC Motor Vehicle Act of 1985 was that the BC Motor Vehicle Act provided for minimum periods of imprisonment for the offense of driving on a highway or industrial road without a valid driver's license or with a license under suspension. Moreover, the act provided that this offense was one of absolute liability in which guilt was established by the proof of driving, whether or not the driver actually knew of the prohibition or suspension. Likewise, individuals will automatically be guilty of Section 91 of the Criminal Code and would likely face jail time simply for having a prohibited firearm, even if they had no idea that the firearm had changed classification behind their back because it was deemed a variant. Or, if a police officer or court's subjective interpretation of what the word variant actually means, made that particular firearm an unnamed variant. But even if you check the FRT to avoid that issue, the police or the courts could have a different subjective interpretation of what makes a variant for that particular firearm, and therefore you could have an unnamed variant without any way to know about it. And this problem was even expressly spelled out and stated as part of Justice Kane's ruling. The FRT is not legally binding, and the determination will be made after the fact once you're already in court. This means that, ultimately, you can't actually know if your firearm is a prohibited variant until after a judge rules whether or not you're guilty of the offense, resulting in an absolute liability offense. And this is the textbook example of what an absolute liability offense actually is. And again, it's worth reminding that absolute liability offenses are fundamentally unjust at a constitutional level in Canada. Justice Kane's non-specified criteria of what a variant is, as well as the potential for that criteria to change over time, creates an absolute liability offense. But any attempt to create a specified definition would have led to infringing on the regulations. And rather than acknowledging this and ruling that the regulations would have been unreasonable in some way, which is the job she is there to do, she instead just ruled that the regulations are in fact vague, but that Parliament had deliberately made them vague, and therefore it's all okay. But that's wrong for two reasons. One, Cabinet is not Parliament. And this is a mistake she repeatedly makes all throughout this judicial review. These regulations are not legislation. They did not receive royal assent. They did not go through debates. They did not go through any of the normal parliamentary processes or committee or through the Senate or anything like that. This is an order in council from cabinet. It's different and their respective authority and amount of power they can wield is different. Two, even if it was parliament, no government has the authority to deliberately make a statute vague. If any criticism of vagueness could be substantiated by merely claiming parliamentary intent, then there could never be any such thing as a vague law, because every vague law would simply be justified by saying Parliament intended for it to be vague to begin with. Like, it's a completely nonsense ruling. But like I say, if this was her only mistake, then it wouldn't quite raise to the level of bias, in my opinion. Odds are, I could just be wrong, or maybe it was an honest mistake on her part, you know, or whatever. But this is far from a one-off in the ruling. And the amount of mental and legal gymnastics she had to go through in order to repeatedly rule in favor of the government and against the statutory limitation on cabinet's authority, I mean, it's just truly awe-inspiring. So because the judge didn't do her job and didn't establish definitions to form precedent, I will not have to do that for her. So in the next video, I will establish and debunk these definitions to show just how badly she screwed up.
But there is one more word we need to define before we start. Marketing. When a company advertises or invents a new label to convince you that you need something that you actually don't, it's called marketing. However, when the government does this, it actually goes by a different name. It's called propaganda. By being blatantly unwilling to either require or assert definitions for these newly invented terms, our judge fell prey to propaganda. Which is, at best, a severe misstep, especially considering that these definitions are essentially the cornerstone of this case. Now, whether you believe this was intentional or not, Justice Kane made all of her rulings almost solely on the basis of propaganda. And if that alone is an incontrovertible evidence of bias, then I will be sure to provide many more examples for you before the end of the series.